Now, would you please turn to the Gospel according to John and chapter 12. Right to the end of the chapter from verse 49 where the Lord is recorded as saying For I have not spoken of myself but the Father which sent me he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak and I know that his commandment is life everlasting whatsoever I speak therefore Even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Now in those two verses, the Lord is telling us quite clearly that everything that he spoke in this world, or the teaching that he gave, was not simply from himself, it was from his Father. Now you have to think of the Son of God here in that familiar phrase that we've got used to using just lately, in a state of humiliation. Now we know that the Son of God is absolutely equal to God in every respect. He's just as eternal as the Father. He's just as mighty as the Father. He's just as wise as the Father. He is, in his very essence, in his very being, God. But when you find um, expressions like this in the New Testament, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me he gave me a commandment and so forth, we have the Saviour speaking, as it were, in his human nature, in his state of humiliation. As God, he is equal, but in terms of how he came into this world, he comes as a servant of God. We've seen that repeatedly in Isaiah just lately. And he comes to do his Father's will, but he comes speaking those things and only those things that his father has commanded him to speak. So the son does not speak independently. He doesn't make up his own mind as to what he should teach and what he should say. He only speaks that which is the father's will for him to speak. So that is just a general introduction or explanation of what the Saviour is driving at here. But what we're going to look at this evening is specifically this reference to a commandment. I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. So, the Father gives the Son, the Saviour, a commandment concerning what he is to say, what he's to teach what his doctrine is going to be. And the essence of that commandment, or the things that the Saviour is going to say and speak of in this world, is explained in verse 50. I know that his commandment is life everlasting. That's the nub of the Saviour's ministry and teaching when he came into the world. And you can think of that, whether you remember the fact that he rebuked people for their sin, whether he, um, uh, as it were, exposed the, the false teaching that the scribes and the Pharisees had developed over the years, and whether he explained that he would go to the cross and die in the place of sinners. All of that together comes up to this in the end. I know that his commandment, in other words, that which I should say and speak and teach in the world, it all boils down to this, His commandment is life everlasting. Now we're going to look at that that one phrase. His commandment is life everlasting. And to understand this, we need to understand the terms. First of all, everlasting life. And then what this commandment actually is that was given to the Lord Jesus. Everlasting life. That term specifically everlasting life is found just a quick count in a concordance is found 12 times Um, the equivalent eternal life is found 28 times and so simple arithmetic tells you that this is a key term in the new testament everlasting life what does it mean Well, it's more or less synonymous 
with salvation. If you think of the opposite of everlasting life, it's everlasting destruction. That's how Paul puts it in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8. He refers to the time when the Lord will return to the world and he speaks of him coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Everlasting life, everlasting destruction, and they are utter opposites one to the other. Everlasting life obviously means to be delivered from everlasting destruction and settle down in heaven with the Lord, to enjoy the presence of God forever, to enjoy and receive all his wonderful blessings, the half of which have not been told us. This is life everlasting, compared with that dreadful prospect of everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, driven out from the presence of a loving and a gracious God, never to know God's smile, never to know God's goodness, never to know God's comfort, even forevermore. Well, everlasting destruction, everlasting life. Both of these, obviously, are everlasting. There's no end. There's no end to destruction, that conscious punishment of hell. But in heaven there is an everlastingness about the blessings of that place and of the experiences that we shall have, have there. No end to them, forever. Everlasting life. Life with God in heaven to come. The Lord Jesus defined it in a very special way in John 17. That prayer. We know it as the great high priestly prayer. And he says this in prayer to his Father. This is life eternal. Now that this is what it's about. This is what it consists of. This is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. To know God, and to know Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And to know there means to know by way of proper experience and relationship. By way of that relationship that will exist between a sinner and his saviour, between a son and his father. Now, we know that, that there are different ways of knowing. I know by sight some of the people that live in the road where our house is. I recognise their faces when I see them out. I recognise them when I see them in the supermarket sometimes, but I don't know them. But I know my wife, I know my children, I know my family, and I know most of you in a different way. We know of God. We know about him. We've read about him perhaps for years. We've heard about him for years. But there's a difference between knowing about him and knowing him. Coming into a relationship with him. Being able to speak with him, confide in him, depend upon him. And having him speak back to us through his word. And that's really what the Christian faith is about. It's about a relationship, a knowing in that intimate, confiding, depending, relying kind of way with Almighty God. And when we know God like that, we're in relationship with him. It's then that we're introduced to this life eternal or life everlasting in its deepest and most wonderful of ways. The God that we know in this world is the God that we shall live with forever in heaven, in the presence of the Lord. And in that place, in that state of heaven, we shall be forever conscious of his love and filled with all his heavenly joy and peace. And that's everlasting life. It's life to know God. It's death and destruction to not know God. And the word that Christ came to bring into the world, or the commandment that God gave concerning Christ, is everlasting life. It's what he spoke about 
It's what he came to obtain on our behalf. Everlasting life then. When do we possess everlasting life? Because we inevitably or instinctively think about everlasting life as something that's future. It's, it's heaven, it's not now, it's, it's future. Heaven is not now, we're not in heaven now. We're on earth now. And everlasting life we associate with, with, with heaven and therefore we think of it as being future. And of course there's a very real sense in which that's true. The young man that came to the Lord Jesus says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He spoke about it as being future. And that of course is a very real element of what eternal life is about. We ultimately receive and experience everlasting life in heaven. That's when we fully know what the Lord is promising to us and will give to us. We read about heaven in the scriptures, but that's about as far as we can go. We can only go as far as, far as the scriptures say concerning heaven. But what it's actually like to be there, what it's actually like to be without sin and to be capable of understanding far, far more than we ever do in this world, and what it's like to actually see Jesus Christ, and what it's actually like to witness the great choir of angels and, and the souls made perfect. What's that like? Can you tell me? Because I can't tell you. It's beyond our understanding, isn't it? But this is everlasting life. No pain, no sorrow, no tears, no regrets, no fears, no anxieties for the future. None of those things. Absolute perfection of life and of happiness. And we think of it, therefore, as being future. But though it's future, there's a very real sense in which it's present. It's in the here and now. Though it's to come, yet we possess it already, if we're Christians. The Lord Jesus said in John 3, and it's in verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And that's all present tense. He that believeth on the Son now, at this moment, hath, at this moment already, eternal life. Now you can have something, you can be in possession of something, without actually experiencing it to its fullness. I don't know how the, the, the law actually works here, but I should think it must be something like this, that when you order something on the internet or on the phone and you pay for it, it's yours, isn't it? You've paid for it. It may not have been delivered yet, but it's yours in principle. You've got a title to it. You expect it to be delivered. You expect it to arrive at your door. And uh, it's yours. It's got your name on it. Until it arrives at the door and you open the parcel, you're not receiving the benefit of what you've ordered, but it's yours. But when it does come and you take the packaging off and you open it up and then you think, ah, this is just what I was expecting. It's just what I ordered. And now... I can begin to enjoy it. And in a sense, in a very poor illustration really, that's what everlasting life is. It's ours because Christ has purchased it for us and God has promised it to us and we believe on Christ and we have everlasting life. We're enjoying a bit of it as it were at the moment, just like when you order something on the internet, that part of the joy of it is anticipating its arrival, isn't it? You think, oh, when it comes, it will solve my problems, it will enhance my life, or whatever it might be, and I enjoy the prospect of it. Well, that's what we're doing as believers. We're enjoying now the prospect of what is to come. But it's ours. It's ours now. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. The Lord didn't say, will have, although he could have done, and he certainly didn't say, might have. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Now friends, if your faith is in Christ, you already have everlasting life. 
you haven't entered into the fullness of the experience of it, that won't come until you reach heaven. But it's yours. It's yours, and it's yours forevermore. Now this, then, is the, the nub of, of what the Lord was commanded to say. And this is really the, the summary, if you like, of all that the Saviour did speak about. I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Let's think about that in uh, three ways, briefly. First of all, this commandment, this commandment that is life everlasting, was a commandment that was given to the Lord Jesus. If you go back to verse 49, it's about what he would say, what he would teach, what he would declare. But we must have to agree, surely, that there would be no point or purpose to Christ, to going around um, Judea and Galilee and so forth, speaking about eternal life and making promises concerning eternal life if that life could never be obtained or experienced and received. That would make him a peddler of falsehoods, and that could never be. So if his words were to speak about eternal life and the receiving of it and the enjoying of it, all that needed to be done for sinful people to obtain that eternal life had first to be accomplished. And this is all part of the commandment. God the Father gives a commandment to the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son, concerning everlasting life. And before he can speak about it, he has to accomplish something in order for that life to be given. So the commandment is about Christ procuring eternal life or everlasting life for his people. I'm sure that we understand this, but all of us have lost any entitlement to everlasting life because of our sin. We've got no hope of it, as we are. Instead, we're condemned and lost to that everlasting destruction that Paul wrote about, and none of us is able to make amends for it, and none of us is able to learn or to earn everlasting life by our own personal efforts. It's beyond us. It's, it's an impossibility. And of course, if anybody knew this, it was God. And therefore the Father commands his Son to come into the world to procure life for his people. Go as a man into the world. We can imagine the Father saying to his Son, go as a man into the world to earn everlasting life for my people. Go and as a man keep all the holy law of God on behalf of my people. They can't do it. And they need someone to do it for them. And you must go and live that perfectly righteous life. And more, go to satisfy all the justice of the law that they've broken. They're all sinners. They're all condemned, all condemned to die. And you are to go and pay that penalty for them, for them, in their place, and for their sakes. You're to go and bear their sin and their guilt and stand condemned for it and suffer all that the law will inflict upon a guilty, condemned sinner. This is the commandment that is life everlasting. Now, the commandment that the Father gives to his Son in this respect proves, doesn't it, the immense, the amazing love of God for his people. I don't think that we have any idea of how wretched and of how much an abomination we are in God's sight. We're deserving of everlasting destruction, of eternal justice, but in love he desires our salvation. And in love he determines that his people will inherit everlasting life. They won't have the hell that they deserve, but they will have the everlasting life that it is in his heart to give to us. Commandment. Notice that. Commandment. The Father gives a commandment to the Son. And how strong is that word? 
You know that when we read about the commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, that's a strict prohibition, isn't it? That's a strict commandment that is given to us. You will do this, you will not do that. It's what God commands, it's not, not an optional thing. It's not an invitation to us. Well, if you feel like um, avoiding adultery, that would be a, a convenient thing for the world. Um, if you could just restrain your anger and not kill your neighbour, that, that would be a good thing too. It doesn't come like that, does it? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not uh, um, kill, and so on and so forth. It's, it's, a, it's a strong term. And it's the same word that is used here. This is not a suggestion that is given to the Son. This is not a proposition that's been put, put before him as being something that we should sit down and consider together, although, strictly speaking, they, you know, the, the, the persons of the Godhead did that. But this is, this is a strong term, a commandment that is given to the Son. And therefore, when the Son received this commandment, he had a great onus that was put upon him, a tremendous responsibility and a charge that he had to discharge. He must come to satisfy his Father's will and to do his Father's good pleasure. It was commanded of him. But we mustn't think that because it's expressed here as being a commandment, that it was a commandment giving, given to a son who was unwilling. The father wasn't overriding the will of the son. Don't think of it like that. It's just an expression really to, to make us to understand how strong is the desire for God to have us saved. A, 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 an expression of that determination of his loving heart that these people are going to be saved and therefore my son must come into the world and die for their sins and so it's expressed in these terms and when the son receives this this invitation or this commandment rather um, not an invitation a commandment there's no unwillingness on his part there's no reluctance there's no hesitation he said in this world my meat is to do my father's will. That's what pleases me. It's what satisfies me. I and my father are one, he said. One in person, one in deity, distinct in person, but one in deity, but also one in purpose. One in decree. One in eternal plan. They are united in all of this. But it's a strong term and it underlines the, the will and the love of God concerning our salvation. So, the Son of God is commanded in this respect concerning life everlasting. My, his commandment is life everlasting and it begins with the commandment for the Son of God to come into the world to be our Saviour. Now, we know the Gospels record it for us, and thank God they do, that all that was given to the Son to do, he came and he did it. Every little last part of it. And we won't go into that this evening, save to say that whatever, whatever is necessary for our salvation, Christ has done it. Nothing has been overlooked, nothing has been left out, Nothing has been left undone. Every last part of the necessary work for our salvation, the Lord Jesus has done. You know the words of the Saviour upon the cross, it is finished. What is? What was finished? All that the Father had given him to do, that's what was finished. It was completed. I've done it all. And soon he commends his spirit into the hands of his Father and our sins have now got an atoning sacrifice and we have one who is actually and really a saviour of sinners. Now, having done all of that, what does the saviour do? Having procured everlasting life, he goes on to proclaim everlasting life. 
I know that his commandment is life everlasting. The work needed to be done, but then the proclamation needed to be made that the work has been done and that sinners can therefore come and place their trust in Christ and salvation is what they hope for and salvation is precisely what they shall receive. And that's the gospel message. And so the Saviour spoke about these things. The speaker, the messenger of these great things was first of all Christ personally when he was upon earth. Even at the outset of his ministry, he went about, Mark's Gospel tells us, chapter 1. He came into, into the country preaching the Gospel. The Gospel is good news. The Gospel is the good news that he has come to be the saviour of sinners. He preached it himself. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's a call, isn't it? It's a proclamation of the, what he was going to do would be the grounds, the means of people's salvation. He's preaching these things all through his life. Even on the cross he did that. You could analyse those words of Christ upon the cross of Calvary and you think to yourself, well, what things he said. And you remember how one of those thieves was converted by what he heard of Christ that day. One minute insulting, abusing the Saviour, the next, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He was preaching the gospel right to the end. He was interceding even for his enemies right to the end. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The whole of the life of Christ was gospel preaching, proclaiming what he would do and at the end proclaiming what he had done. But then, of course, the Lord returns to glory, but the Lord continues to speak and proclaim the gospel, this commandment, which is eternal life, everlasting life, through his apostles, that's what they did. It's what Peter did on the day of Pentecost. It's what Paul did wherever he went on his missionary journeys and the other apostles. Legend, tradition has it that the other apostles went all over the place. We've got no record of it in the, in the scriptures, but that's, that's what we're led to believe by early church historians. But by one person or another, the gospel was preached. And the commandment, you see, is given, and the commandment is being accomplished. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. It's clear gospel preaching, calling people to believe upon the Saviour. Hear the message. Behind the messenger is the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did the apostles go through the world? Was it their idea? No. The very word apostle means sent. Christ sent them and he sent them to preach the gospel. Why do we have evangelical churches in the modern age? Because Christ has raised them up. Why are there gospel ministers in a day like this? Because God has raised them up. We preach the things of God and we seek to do so with all the earnestness of God himself and with the sincerity of these messages and of these promises. And it's Christ that speaks through individual Christians. <clears throat> we spoke about this this morning, but you know, we go to our families, we go to our workplaces, we go in our neighbourhoods, and we report that which we have heard, which we have seen, those experiences of God's saving grace that we have known. And this is the proclamation that still goes on in the world concerning everlasting life. That's the great essence of the message. And how does this everlasting life come? Well, we know this, but it comes by repentance and it comes by faith. Repentance, turning away from our unbelief, turning away from our willful self, 
self-pleasing lives and seeking to live as God would have us to live in this world. Faith, giving up our empty dreams of all things turning out all right in the end. Turning away from our self-righteousness and trusting in Christ and in Christ alone. That's how we obtain this everlasting life. Who does the word come to? His commandment is everlasting life. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Who does this message come to? Who is it addressed to? Well, we have such a clear proof in the word of God that this message of salvation is to go to everybody, everyone, without exception. There is this wonderful word that you keep coming across in the New Testament, whosoever. And you know what that means, whoever. Whoever it is. It doesn't matter who you are, whoever. Whosoever. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's that expression again. Whosoever. John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this, whosoever you see. You have the same with the apostles, Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 2. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, you find people sometimes that think that they have to go through a kind of qualifying procedure before they're entitled to call upon the Lord. Not true. Not true. There's no probationary period that you have to pass through before you can call upon the Lord for salvation. Any more than there is a, a kind of a qualifying period that we have to go through before we obey the commandments of the Lord. Why do we obey the commandments of the Lord? Because he gives them to us. That's enough. Why do we believe upon Christ? Because he tells us to. That's enough. Whosoever believeth. We don't have to wait in fact, waiting is a dangerous game. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul again in Romans 10, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is rich unto all that call upon him. See that? All. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there's that wonderful verse toward the end of the scriptures, in the book of the Revelation, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Who's the Spirit? The Holy Spirit of God. Who's the Bride? The Bride of Christ, the Church of Christ. The Spirit and the Bride, the Church, say to the world, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst, Come, and Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Do we want to know about qualifications for believing on Christ? Well, let me tell you about the only one that there is. You need to be a lost sinner. It's the only qualification you need. And are we lost sinners? Oh my word, we are. Without exception, we all are. And therefore, this word is for us. His commandment is life everlasting. Christ preached the gospel then, the word that was given to him concerning the work that he did in this world, and he still stands in heaven to proclaim that same message, that he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And now's the time to believe. Our need will never be greater. There's never any advantage in delay. And now's the time 
to believe on the Saviour. You know, there's a sense in which, although this word was given as a commandment to Christ, it also comes as a commandment to us. Yes, it is an invitation. You see in the scriptures pleadings, beseechings that come from God, warnings and, and, and earnest callings to the people. The Old Testament's full of it, as well as the New. But it's an invitation that comes with all the strength and the passion of a command. Paul said in Acts 17 in Athens, that God, God, though God for over the years has winked at all of the transgressions of men, yet now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Again, an inadequate illustration, but you know, if the building was on fire and you didn't know it, and I stood here and I saw the flames enveloping the door, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to suggest to you in a very gentle, non-committal, undemanding kind of way, do you think it would be a good idea to evacuate the building? Um, if you think it would be, let's, um, let, let, let's, let's talk about it. Now, what you would expect for me to do would be to sound an alarm. And for all of us to rapidly exit the building in order that our lives may be spared. And that's how the commandment comes from God. This is not some small matter that we deal with. This is not some incidental thing that Christ came to do and to accomplish and then to proclaim. This is a matter of life and death. And more than that, it's a matter of everlasting life or everlasting death. That's why it's a command. God, in his grace and in his love, says, rise up. Don't sleep anymore. Believe on Christ and be saved. It's a command that's given with divine love. For the Lord, as Peter puts it, is not slack concerning his promise, as men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is the word of commandment that was given to God's Son. Go and be their saviour, and then proclaim that salvation to the people. And he proclaims it to us now, and it's for us to believe his word and to receive everlasting life.